Hey guys, welcome back to another installment of the Mountainside Apologetics series. We've been through some science, some evolution, some existence of God kind of stuff, and hopefully it's been enriching. Today, I'm going to talk about the Bible. I'm going to talk specifically about the reliability of the Bible. There's two horns to this question of how Christians think about the Bible. One is the inspiration of Scripture, and one is the reliability of Scripture. If Scripture was inspired, should it be passed down to us in a reliable form? And if we have it in this form that we have it today, is it okay to call it inspired Scripture if it doesn't mimic what it was originally written to be? Those are some of the questions we're going to look at. We're going to look at manuscripts, variants. We're going to look at a lot of what the objections are to the reliability of the Bible. And to do that, I'm going to draw on a scholar from the University of North Carolina. His name is Bart Ehrman. He wrote Misquoting Jesus, and Jesus Interrupted. He's been leading the way in liberal scholarship, that is scholarship that tends to shed a lot of doubt on the text of Scripture, that what we hold is, in fact, the text that is the same as the text that was written originally. So it's a little bit of a different question than asking, did God inspire the Bible? But if the Bible's inspired in its original form, we need to know, do we still have that original form? Do we trust what it says in the scriptures? So we're going to listen to some clips here from Bart Ehrman, and I'm going to do my best to provide some responses and to provide some ways to maybe think about the types of accusations that he makes, because the accusations that he makes are being echoed from people who are skeptical against the Bible today. So here's Bart. This has been the core of my research for the past 30 years. At some point I came to the realization that my belief in the inerrancy of the autographs didn't make sense. If God inspired the Bible without error, why hadn't he preserved the Bible without error? I couldn't think of a good answer then, and I still can't think of a good answer now, even though I think I've heard every answer ever proposed. I couldn't any longer believe that God had inspired the originals because I was sure he had not preserved the original. So in this first clip, Bart Ehrman seems to say that the text of the Bible can't be inspired if God wouldn't preserve the inspired form down to us today. There's a little bit of a circle in, in there, a little bit of a circular reasoning. Maybe he's trying to draw a conclusion uh, off of what he sees now. It says, if God is operating this way in Scripture now, doesn't it make sense that he would operate in that way then? Okay, maybe a fair question. What is his take? Well, what he sees is that the original form of Scripture has not been preserved, and if it has not been preserved, there is no reason to consider that the Bible was inspired in its original form. But I think as we go forward, we're going to find out that these claims that the Bible is not in its original form are really misleading. And besides that point, does it make sense for Ehrman to say that if God inspired the original writings of the Bible, that it must be in a perfect inspired form now? Now, the Latin Vulgate had a struggle with being the inspired translation. Later, the King James Version by certain small groups was called the inspired translation, even more accurate than the original autographs. Hmm. Now, the vast majority of evangelical Christianity does not label the Bible that way. In fact, they would say, well, what we're doing now is trying to recreate what God originally put in the original language to the inspired authors. Christian theology has always said it's the authors, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who wrote the text that God had intended to be in the Bible. And what happens is that man's free will and God's inspiration coalesce, so there's not necessarily any errors that take place in the writing of that book. Now, would this make sense, given the God that we've come to know exists through the cosmological argument, teleological argument, etc.? This intelligent God has a desire to connect with mankind, does it make sense that he would communicate with mankind in such a way? And I think it does. I think God would use any means that we have available to connect his 
perfect holy presence to a sinful people. Yet without him compromising his presence and without us having to die and become perfectly holy in order to connect with him first. And writing is one of these ways that cements that. A text that can serve as a standard. So it makes sense that God would do this. Now, Ehrman, he comes off the presumption that God does not exist. And he does so not because of mistakes in the Bible or anything like that, but he does so because of an emotional problem against the problem of evil. He sees the evil in the world and the sufferings that he's had to endure as reason to think that a good God doesn't care about him. We'll have to address that question another time, but just to say, Ehrman is not an impartial observer in this. And maybe we should admit that none of us really are. But Ehrman's problem, as he said in, in this clip, is that God had apparently not preserved his word. Does he promise to preserve his word? He does. How do we define the word? Is it a King James Bible? Is it an NASB Bible? Is it an NIV Bible? Is it Latin, Greek, Hebrew, what? Well, God's word tends to mean three things. The text, Jesus, and his present communication with us. So in God preserving his word, these things come together. If we seek him, we see him in the word. And if there is a mistake, that mistake tends to not transcend what God can communicate. After all, when we read English Bibles, we may read 50 different translations with different wordings and yet receive the same kind of things about the message that it's trying to communicate. So the question would then become, are any of these errors such that what would be intended to communicate would not be present. And I think we'll find that that's not the case. Let's hear more from Bart. Let me tell you now what I think about this entire situation, which is that, the, that we cannot know whether the Gospels have been preserved accurately through the ages. And I'm going to try and illustrate with you by explaining how it worked. Take the Gospel of Mark. Whenever Mark was written, say it was written in the year 65 or in the year 70, in the city of Rome, say, I don't know where it was made, whoever wrote Mark put it in circulation and somebody copied the Gospel of Mark. Then somebody copied that copy and somebody copied the copy of the copy. Then somebody copied the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy. Of the copy. And we don't have any of those copies. Okay, he doesn't know how many lines of transmission have taken place before we have that copy. This is speculation, and this is classic Ehrman overstating his point. Okay, do we have the originals? Probably not. Do we have copies of the copies? Okay, at that point, you really don't know how many generations you have to go through. He's using the presumption that our earliest copy of Mark is 220 AD. I think there's evidence for at least a fragment of Mark that's even in the first century. Furthermore, You've got a lot of attestation from church fathers, even starting in the first century, that are citing all the books of the Bible. If Bart Ehrman's correct, we should be seeing all kinds of errors between the fragment from the first century and the church father citations from the first century, and even more so in the second century. That's not at all what we see. Everybody who copied the text made mistakes. Our first surviving copy of Mark probably dates to around the year 220 A.D. That is, 150 years after Mark was first produced. Our first complete copy of Mark comes from the year 350, about 280 years after Mark. Okay, 280 years after Mark. Again, misleading and overstating the point, he fails to mention all the citations of Mark. Early church fathers cited every piece of the Bible other than a few verses, I think, in Jude. So the entirety of Mark was cited by church fathers long before Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus. So the earliest complete copy that he's talking about is in one volume. He's not stating that there may be an accumulation of earlier copies that would give us the totality of Mark. See how he's kind of misleading the listener to think that the case is more drastic than it actually is. We've 
of years, a thousand years after Mark, we get lots of copies. When you compare all of these copies with one another, they all differ from one another. Again, he's being misleading about the term differ here. If I differed from the person that I was yesterday, maybe I cut my hair or got a tattoo or something like that. Some change, some alteration was made, but in essence, I'm not differing. Right? If I, if I trim something up, if I develop in some way, if I'm a pound lighter or heavier, okay, there's, there's this slight, slight modification. But to use the word differ, Ehrman seems to be trying to imply that what we have there is nothing like what we have here. And that's simply not the case. And when you press him on this, he'll, he'll admit it. But using the term differ is kind of disingenuous. Are there changes across these manuscripts? Sure there are. Are some of the changes significant? Well, very rarely is the essence of the thing changed. No. So if he could clarify what he means by differ, it would kind of soften his case. But then again, I'm afraid he wouldn't get all the speaking engagements, wouldn't get all the attention that he tends to get by being this extreme about the differences that are contained in the manuscripts. So changes are going to happen naturally, too. You're going to have language that goes through trends and shifts and develops over time, just like the English language has. If you were to look at Shakespeare's Hamlet from 1603 and look at a modern copy, much less a modern English type of version, the changes are numerous over the course of 400 years. Well, I would imagine with the development of the Greek language, maybe especially early on, some of these changes are going to be natural because the most common change, difference, if you want to use his word, that you see in the New Testament is the movable new, which is the difference between saying a apple and an apple. A letter that makes no essential word meaning difference. But is he going to say that that's the, what the majority are? Nah. He's, he wants to make the case sound much more drastic than it actually is. And what is striking is that, that the, the earlier you go to look at the manuscripts, the more differences you find. The earliest copies have the most mistakes. The earliest copies have the most mistakes. He's going to use this to say that as we go earlier, it's going to be kind of like a, a reverse graph. That uh, as it... The text of it stays in harmony here, but when you go back earlier, it gets a little worse. So if you get back right to the time that it was written, it must be really horrible. Okay, first of all, there's no reason to think that. There's, there's not a logical step you can take to say that since more differences were made in the 200s AD, say, uh, 1 or 200s AD, that that means that the original copies must have been that much worse. Okay, there's no step that he can take to say that. He assumes that. And by the way, I've never, I've never really seen solid attestation to the fact that early manuscripts are so poorly transcribed. But what else does this say? It says a couple things. He's admitting that there's a lot of early manuscripts by which he can make the comparison between later manuscripts. Something he didn't admit before. These early manuscripts uh, really lend to the credence of, of the word, as long as the differences are nominal in nature. But he's also saying that he knows that differences are in there. How does he know that differences and mistakes are made unless he knows what an original may look like? He's kind of unwittingly trapping himself into saying that he has an idea of what the original should look like if he's going to suggest that there are mistakes. What would happen if we found copies that were still earlier? The only evidence we have is the evidence that survives, which suggests that in the early periods of copying, there was the most mistakes made. Again, notice that he's admitting that there's a wealth of early manuscripts to look at. But a moment ago, he said that really the only mark we have to look at is from maybe the Codex Sinaiticus, 350 AD. Or, or maybe that piece from 220 AD. If he knows of all these differences from very early on, then where's the attestation that he said wasn't there when he said the, full, the first full copy of Mark wasn't until 
270 years later. That doesn't make sense. You can tell in what he's willing to bring up for his purposes, he's trying to be a little misleading in the information that he presents. How many were made the first month or the first year or the first decade? How many mistakes were made in the copy of the copy of the copy, which served as the copy of all the copies that we now have? We have no way of knowing. How interesting that he equates the term, we have no way of knowing, with the term, it must have been a bunch. Well, okay, we have no way of knowing it is a step to the honest side, but he is saying that to try to strike fear in those who believe in the reliability of the Bible, the New Testament. But if he's saying that these copies are going out and the mistaken copies are being transmitted, so what we eventually see, maybe if, if he is right, seven generations down the road, is that these variants, these extreme changes, should be reduplicated in these copies that are maybe hundreds of miles apart. Is that what we see? No! When we compare copies from different regions, do we see differences? Yeah, there's some differences. Maybe they're cultural, regional. Maybe it's a scribe trying to clarify a certain word. Maybe he's using kind of a bad copy and mis misreads one letter here and there. Is the essence different? No. So even taking his assumption that the first scribes were really poor at copying the copies, these should be reduplicated in these expansive regions. And even in these later manuscripts, even if it's after 400 AD, shouldn't those errors that he says ought to be present in those early copies, shouldn't those be reduplicated in these various regions? Well, they ought to be. That seems to be where he's going with this. Is that what we see? No. He's having to assume it. And what evidence does he have? He admits there's not evidence. Just that people earlier made worse mistakes. They weren't as highly trained. And maybe it's not a matter of, oh, they were so terrible at making copies. Maybe it's a matter of when there were strict training regimens in place for copying the manuscripts of the Bible, maybe things just got extremely excellent in making those copies. Maybe the errors that were made originally were kind of normal, honest mistakes made by people who were writing and extremely tired because of the 10, 12 hours that they would spend on making those copies. But the bottom line is, if errors were made early on and sent out to these various regions, that should still be reflected and it's not. Therefore, the earliest copies that he says must be so terrible can't be any worse than the copies of the copies we see in the various regions across time. If Craig thinks that we have a way of knowing how the gospel was changed in its first hundred years, I want to know what the answer is, because I've worked on this problem for 30 years, and I don't know of a way to know, and I've never seen a good explanation. How do you know the copies are made from accurate copies? I kind of feel like I explained that a little bit, but he's pressing the point a little more. The early copies were errant, so how do you know that it's, it's been accurate down to that point? Uh, well, a couple ways that you could know is comparing the furthest reaches of the differences between the copies that you do have. Okay, that's one way. The differences in the original copies doesn't seem like they would be worse than what you have in these expansive regions. It's kind of like with genetics and evolution, when you have a species that isolates from another, one can change so much that it no longer can reproduce with this other. And they begin to go down the line of, of adapting to these changes and having genetic changes that take it further and further away from mimicking the appearance of this one. Now, in that, you have these developments that change regionally and by the influence of that culture around them, where this one is going through similar changes in its own culture and region. We would think that in the text of the New Testament, or the Gospel of Mark, like he's saying here, that if it's going to these different regions and it's being influenced by this region here and being influenced by this region here, and these changes are continually being made, that they would continue to divert. So it would make more sense that the later copies 
would diverge even more from each other. And as you draw back earlier to the time, maybe they were copied worse, but they're not going to be as divergent still as the later ones. But we see that the later copies still closely adhere. So it's not like two different regions, two different breeds of frogs that could no longer reproduce. It's more like this, this melting pot uh, that brings back together the ideas. We don't see the diversity across the different regions that we would expect if the copies were manipulated at the start, sent into different regions, and allowed to be manipulated in their respective regions. What we still see is high, high accuracy. When is he going to bring that up? You can't argue that, the, uh, that we have lots and lots of copies of Mark, and therefore we know what was originally in Mark. These lots and lots of copies are from many centuries after Mark was written. How could we know that these copies stem from a correct copy instead of an errant copy? Our earliest ones are all highly errant. Sometimes you will hear Christian apologists say that the New Testament is the best attested book from antiquity, and therefore you can trust it. It's true it's the best attested book from antiquity, but the attestation is all from a thousand years later. Whoa, he gets pretty misleading on this point. Although he's also making an important claim, an important point of agreement with the Christians, that the Bible is the best attested book from antiquity. And if you were to see the charts showing how many manuscripts attest to the Bible, how early those manuscripts begin appearing compared to Homer's Iliad, which is a distant second, and then other writings from history are a long ways off from that as well, including the writings of Plato. So he agrees it's the best attested, but all the attestation is from a thousand years later. Um, no, it's not. You just told me that early copies of Mark were more manipulated than later copies of Mark. Are you only referring to thousand-year-old copies of Mark? No. You must be referring to something early, which tells me that there is early attestation, but you will only use that early attestation to work in your favor, and you won't use it when it could maybe compromise your point. Fact is... The early attestation is much earlier than the other books of antiquity. And as you begin to traverse time from a hundred years after the writings to a thousand years after the writings to today, you see the same essential writing. It doesn't make sense to say that you could trust it because it's well attested. If the New Testament was well attested, then you could say what the New Testament originally said. Whether you should trust it or not is another question. I think we get a clue here into the nature of Ehrman's doubts. Whether you can trust it is a different question, although you can avoid that question of trusting it, of believing what it says, by saying that it is not accurately passed down to us. I can avoid the message of Christ as long as the Bible does not present the message of Christ the way that it was intended by Christ. But the reality is we have lots of late manuscripts of Mark and of every other book of the New Testament. We don't have early ones, and the, er the earliest ones we have are filled with mistakes. There's a classic blend of truth and error there. He says, we've got lots of late manuscripts. That's true. There are lots of late manuscripts. Do you know why? Because the Bible is the most popular book in human history, by far. It's natural and it's expected that there would be more writings as time accumulates. The population of the world increases. The message of Christ spreads across the world. Every piece of the world wants knowledge of Scripture and the technology to be able to produce scripture more efficiently also continues to increase even in manuscript copies. It was harder to come by paper earlier on. Later on, it became more of a technology, easier to preserve, easier to make copies and things like that. So we would expect later copies to be more abundant, but also because earlier copies weren't always preserved. Sometimes the text would become non, not legible. What do you do at that point? Do you preserve it just because it's a relic? Well, no. 
They believed the word of God was more than ink on a page. They believed it was something that changed the human heart. So they were okay with either destroying that piece of papyrus or burning it in the flames or writing over the top of it. It's called palimpsests. There's a whole study devoted to it. They were okay with that. So naturally, some of the early copies were being destroyed. And so for several reasons, we should expect a whole lot more later copies than earlier copies. Does that mean there's not a good amount of early copies? No. And I find it surprising, again, that he says we don't have any early copies. It's funny, again, because you told us a few minutes ago that Mark's early copies have all kinds of errors. If there are no early copies, why are you saying that the early copies are so in error? And I'll say it again, the early copies are not in any drastic error. Daniel Wallace is, he's the guy that debates airmen. Uh, not in these clips, I guess, but it was Craig Evans in these clips, but in other, at other times, airmen debates Wallace. Uh, to me, Wallace definitely has the upper hand. Wallace makes some pretty important conclusions about the, the text of Scripture with him. And one of the things he says is that in all our research, in all our recent findings of the last, I don't remember, 50 years maybe, we never find a new reading that's not already in the manuscript record. And they continue to find early and earlier copies. And he's saying that these early copies, these later copies, there's nothing that becomes introduced that's new into the manuscript record. In other words, it seems like we've seen the diversity of copies that are out there. I guess to make an English parallel, you might say the, the New Living Translation is kind of the more easy-to-read, English-friendly, simple version of the Bible. And you may have a tougher to read, like an original King James, ESV is a little tough for some people, a little bit more cumbersome language. We have this spectrum, and it seems like all the copies that are being made now fall somewhere in between. So seeing the spectrum of errors that are contained in the Bible, and seeing that no new variants are being introduced, no new readings are being introduced into the text, what should we say? That the texts are still too diverse to really have any idea of what the original said? That's not at all what Wallace says. And he's devoting his life to this kind of research too. And frankly, he actually makes a lot of Christians mad with some of the things he says because he says that certain things in your Bible should not be in the Bible. Referring specifically to the King James Version, which contains the Trinity verse in 1 John 5.7. He believes that the longer ending of Mark should not be in the Bible. I believe that it's accurate information that's not original with Mark because it reads far too differently. And he believes that the woman caught in adultery in John 7, 52 to 8, 11, he believes that that's not original there. And I agree. When you read through the book of John, uh, 7, 52 and 8, 12, it looks like it flows one right into the other, and this story is kind of inserted. Does that mean the story didn't happen? I think it happened. Does it mean it's not original with John? Not sure about that. Does that mean that it should maybe go with a different book? Maybe. Does that mean it's not edifying and that God never intended for it to be there? I don't think that's the case either. I think when we consider what God may be doing with how manuscripts have been passed down to us now, I think it's fairly easy to see that, yes, he has preserved his word. And he's always used human free will to accomplish something that he's accomplishing. And in the original writers, there weren't mistakes, but there are differences in the human tendency for an author like Mark and the difference that he has with an author like Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the most brilliant wordsmiths from history. And the book of John reads much more simply than the book of Luke, who uses technical language as a doctor. So God uses these human tendencies to still bring about what he intends to bring about. So may it be that the long ending of Mark, though it's not original with Mark, that God had superseded that such a thing would be passed on to us now. 
could be. And I think it's fair to recognize, and we should recognize just as honest Christians, that there are parts that we contain in the Bible that were maybe not original with that author. And there are also parts in the Bible, and Wallace says this too, there are parts that we are not sure exactly whether it should read this way or this way. And 1 Timothy 3.16 is an example I'll use. I'm not sure if it should say, God was manifested in the flesh, or he who was manifested in the flesh. Both are appropriate to the text, and the difference is a little line in the middle of what looks like an O, whether it should read theos or read as a pronoun. Little mistakes like that. The Lord's Prayer. Should it be the short version or should it be the long version? Or maybe it should be the long version here and the short version here. Well, scribes would say, let's just parallel the versions or let's parallel an Old Testament quote and kind of fill in the rest of that quote. Okay, taking too many liberties? Probably. Easy to detect mistakes? That too. And Wallace is really good at identifying what additions were probably made on the text. Now, none of the additions seem dishonest or like they are pushing some theological agenda. And that's not something that these liberal scholars are willing to admit. There are not changes that appear to be dishonest and pushing some kind of agenda, religious, political, or otherwise. The mistakes are honest. The mistakes are sometimes with decent intentions, it looks like. Sometimes there's marginal notes. If it's not clear what a pronoun should refer to, maybe they'll write the name instead of a pronoun, and that becomes a large variant. Like I said, the movable new, natural language changes leads to the vast majority of variants. Spelling differences. In English, we have the word color with the O-R. In Great Britain, they have O-U-R for color. Spelling differences. Mistakes? Agenda being pushed? No. Cultural appropriateness in the writing of that manuscript. And that seems to be what we see over and over and over, over 99% of the time in the textual variants. And remember, we're not comparing one manuscript with one other manuscript or two, three, four manuscripts. We're comparing thousands. 5,800 or more of these are in the Greek language. And as Wallace says, what we continue to see is consistency through these. Consistency of message, consistency of essence. There are areas of difficulty, yes, but none of these areas of difficulty would lead us into any theological difference. No essential doctrine is jeopardized by any of these variants. Did you hear that? No essential doctrine, no cardinal belief that Christians hold to is jeopardized by any of these viable variants. Not one. Every point of doctrine is already established and is irrespective of whether a variant would read this way or that way. And this implies that the variants are actually spread really thin throughout the Bible. Now, Ehrman will try to get a lot of mileage out of the point that there are 400,000 variants in New Testament manuscripts. And guess what? Wallace agrees. Craig Blomberg also agrees. And Blomberg says that that would equate to about one variant for every 16 pages of manuscript text. 30,000 manuscripts, 5,800 Greek manuscripts, 400,000 variants spread out across through all those. Because, let's think of what a variant is. A variant is a mistake or a change in the text, but it's a change that may be reproduced a thousand times, and that would count as a thousand variants. So where there are 400,000 variants and less than 200,000 words in the New Testament, that is not to suggest that there are more variants than words. If you count up all the words across all the manuscripts, you have millions. In fact, you have millions of pages of text in these manuscripts. So given that number of manuscripts, given that number of variants, Blomberg says that equates to one variant for 16 pages of text. Now, my own math has equated it to one variant for every six and a half pages or 13 pages, depending on how you count pages, front and back or not. 
okay, that takes a lot of the steam out of the argument that Ehrman's trying to make, that we can't know what it says. When Ehrman says that we can't know what the New Testament is supposed to say, what he is saying is we don't know whether it should be the pronoun or the name used in that location. He's not saying there's any sort of essential difference to it. And yes, he'll bring up areas that we're not sure if it should say this or this. But guess what? We have the understanding that it may say either this or this. We have a few hundred places where we're not sure what the original text said. But what we are sure of is that it's choice A, choice B, or choice C. It's in the text of our Greek New Testament or it's in the footnotes of the Greek New Testament. It's never choice D, none of the above. And so what it comes down to is we have the totality of all the text of Scripture. In fact, we have more than the totality of all the text of Scripture. We have a little extra at times. We have variants. So we have the original, which is traced through the manuscript line, and we have these variants, these, these mistakes, or these, these little doctored up sections, these alterations that are made probably with fine intentions, spelling differences, understanding, language shifts, things of that nature. But somewhere in there is the complete, accurate text of the New Testament. Wallace is basically certain of this. And I have a Greek professor who is very certain of this. And he used to say that he would about stake his life on the fact that what we have in the modern Greek New Testament is the totality of what was originally written, originally intended to be in the text of Scripture. That doesn't mean there's no issues and no difficulties. It just means that the with the difficulties there, there's still the preserved entirety of the intended Scripture of the New Testament. Does that make sense? Does that raise your confidence level in the New Testament a little bit? I, I hope it does. Lots of issues uh, with this question, and we could certainly go into a lot more detail about variants, how they sneak in, what they exactly look like. I've looked a lot at this, and it was especially a couple summers ago when I was really trying to study up on the King James Only movement and found out that they did not have a leg to stand on, that yes, the newer translations of the Bible exactly mimic the best manuscript tradition that we have today. It is so much more well attested than any book of antiquity. And I'm confident that if there was not the conviction nature that's contained in the Bible, that no scholar would have any issue with the accurate transmission of it. But since it makes these huge claims that often have a strong bearing on a person's life, it makes it really hard to accept. So we have the facts. We have our Christian biases, yes, where we don't want to think that there's any mistakes. There are some issues to look at. But we can't also go to the extreme of Ehrman, Dan Brown, Jesus Seminar, and others, and say, oh no, since there are variants, we can't know what the Bible is supposed to say. Not true. And remember, the Word of God is three things. It's the text, it's Jesus, and it's what God presently speaks to you. When we have the text, and we have a knowledge of Jesus, and we have a living relationship with Christ, with the God of the universe, the text comes alive. And that's where we're brought to the awareness that the menial nature of any of the differences in the text is overwhelmed by the fact that God communicates with us through his word. And let him communicate with you in all three fashions, drawing you personally close to him, and drawing you to an awesome understanding of the text that he has inspired, we can prove that later, and that he has preserved in a manner that we are still confident that this is what he wants to tell us, his people. So we'll see you soon, talk to you again next time, Mountainside Apologetic Series. I'm Evan Vansickle, blessing and a privilege to bring this to you. Love you guys, God bless and guide you.